Good morning. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at um, Jesus and Peter walking on the water in Matthew 14. And um, we have a lot to cover, so I'm just going to jump right in. So let me pray. Lord, thank you that um, while we were here, you are in our midst. We welcome you, Lord. We pray for your Holy Spirit to move in this place. Lord, move in us. That we may know your presence, that we may know you more, that we may trust you a little bit more today. Our faith might grow as we go back out to the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Matthew 14, actually, I'm going to read off of that if that's okay, if it's there. Okay. Uh, Matthew 14, 22 to 33 says this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he, di- while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dis- dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it's I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter said, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But when he saw the winds and the waves, he was afraid, and, he be- and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why do you doubt? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. There's a lot in this. I'm sure this is a very familiar passage to most of you. Um, so it's always, you know, it's, as, as preparing for this time, you know, you're kind of like, Lord, what do you have for us right now? Because I've read this, you know, 50 times. But right now, I'm in a different place. What do you have for me right now? What do you have for us right now? So that's, that's been my prayer, and I hope um, God's words come through to you in that. Um, so I'm going to actually start with a little background. Because I think it's important, this is kind of the context in in which all of this is happening, right? So in the last day, Jesus has been literally teaching the multitudes. Like wherever he goes, there's a crowd following him, right? And he's been spending the last couple days teaching the multitudes, and he's been doing so in parables, in words that they can understand, but they can't seem to get a hold of. You know, I mean, Jesus is trying to tell you, this is what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom, like George talked about last week, it's like this mustard seed. You know, it's like these weeds, it's like this. And they're like, they can't quite get it because what their idea of the kingdom of heaven and what Jesus is saying doesn't seem to match up. And so they're like, that can't be right. Is that, that can't be right, right? And they're having a hard time getting that. Jesus has been teaching the multitudes for a full day. He goes to his hometown, Nazareth. And he teaches in the temple, and it says that he can do um, few miracles there because of the lack of faith, because they all said, don't we know him? Isn't he Mary's son? We know his brothers. We know his sisters. And so Jesus couldn't do much there. And then right after that, he finds out that his cousin, John the Baptist, his forerunner, you know, kind of the prophet who went before him, has been killed. Right? So Herod, who is one of, the, one of the governors, one of the four governors of the Roman Empire at the time, is having an affair with his sister-in-law, his brother's wife, Herodias. And John has stood up to him and said, that's wrong. This adulterous, incestuous affair you're having, this is wrong. You should not be doing this. And so Herod put him in jail. Herod really wanted to kill him, but he was afraid to do so because the crowd thought he was a prophet. Right? So he's in jail. It's Herod's birthday. Herod's, during Herod's birthday, his niece, so I know there's a lot of family orientation here, but um, his, his sister-in-law's daughter dances for him, and it pleases him. And so he says, an oath, ask whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. 
she asks her mom, Herodias, and Herodias says, ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter to be brought to you. It says Herod was troubled because he had made this oath, but what, it was, what they asked for was extreme. But he did it, and John the Baptist, they killed him. They brought his head to her, and she brought it to her mother. I don't know about you, but if you hear that, that takes some time, right? If that happened to anyone I remotely know, you think, wait, John the Baptist? Like, he hasn't really done anything crazy. That's a kind of severe way to die, don't you think? So John's, John's disciples bury him, and they tell Jesus this. And, and this is, you know, as soon as that happens, Jesus is like, I need to go to a solid, I need to go be alone. I need to go reconnect with God. I need to go to this solitary place. And so he gets in a boat with his guys, and he goes, you know, he's going across the lake. And when he gets there, when he arrives, 5,000 people are waiting for him. And that, that's just the men, not including the women and children. 5,000. That's like an introvert's worst nightmare. Right? You're like, I'm in, I just want to go be alone. And you're like, what happened? Right? So there's 5,000 people, and they're, they brought their sick, and they're needy from all over, and they're waiting for him. And it says that when Jesus landed, when he was hoping to get some solitude, he looked at the crowd, and he had compassion on them. And he healed every single one. Every single one. Right? This, just imagine, I want you guys to be put into this situation because I do think it matters. And the, the disciples do what I typically would have done if I was in that same situation. They're very logical. They're like, hey, listen, it's getting kind of late. There's a lot of people here. We don't have enough food. Why don't you send them back to the village? Let them go get some food. And Jesus is like, don't send them away. You feed them. All right, I mean, okay, Jesus, come on. Like, we've got enough for maybe 12 of us. There's five loaves, two fish. And he's like, bring what you have. The little that you have, bring it to me. And so they bring it to Jesus, and Jesus breaks the bread, thanks God for it, and gives it back to the disciples to give to the crowd. And it says that everyone ate, 5,000 men plus women and children, everyone ate until they were satisfied. And there were 12 basketfuls of leftovers. I mean, he was just showing off at this point, right? You're like, come on. But that, so, so this is when, then it, this is where we pick up our text, okay? And the reason I'm telling you this is because that's a lot of things that happen in a row where you're just like, and I just, I just want to be alone. I just want to be alone. So this is where we pick up our text, and Jesus says, it says immediately, which by the way, it says immediately like three or four times in this. I think that's important. But it says immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd, Right? So I don't know if that was a decoy boat, because the last time he got in a boat and then he landed, there were 5,000 people. He could have just sent them out the way. You know? But he's like, I'm just going to stay here. You go out there, right? So he sends them out there. Um, you go to the other side. Well, I dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself, and he prayed. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves, because the wind was against them. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Now, I have a first, my first question is this. So the, the disciples are in a boat, they're in the middle of this lake, right? And they've, they're fighting this winds and the waves, and, the, and they're just like struggling against it. Why are they, why do, why are they in a boat in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the storm. Why, why are they there? Exactly. Jesus told them to do it. Jesus said, get in a boat and meet me on the other side. And they're being obedient to what God has asked them to do. And they face a humongous storm. Has that ever happened to you? Does that mess with your theology a little bit when you're like, Jesus, I'm doing what you asked me to do. You told me to come here. And then meanwhile, you're like, why am I fighting all these battles? Why is this happening? Right? Jesus, Jesus asked them to be there, but I think we have this false thinking in our head that if I'm doing what God asked me to do, it's going to be easy. Anybody else think that, right? If you read the Bible, that's not true ever. I mean, literally, it's not true ever. Anytime God has called someone to do something, 
there's always opposition. There's always storms. There's always things that they come against, right? So they find themselves in this storm, right? And the disciples, they're terrified. And it says that they were terrified. When they saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. And they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Now, just this, again, just a little bit of background. But they're in the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is about 60, 68 square miles. Okay, it's about the size of D.C., Right? And a typical, it's like one-third of all the fresh water um, it, that supplies for Israel. It's their biggest supply of, of drinking water that they have. Right? And it's, you know, typically, to get from one side to the other, they're like, oh, go to the other side. Typically, that takes a few hours. Just a couple hours to get from one side to the other. Now, Jesus told the, the disciples to get in the boat immediately after dinner. And now it's right before dawn. Okay? So that means there's some people say it's between six and ten hours, which is a lot longer than two, that they have been out there struggling against the wind and the waves. Right? So you can't use your sail because it's, you know, because it's, too, it's too dangerous out. So they have been working the oars, straining against this wind and waves for six to ten hours. That is a lot of time. Right? So they're like, I'm sure they are exhausted. I'm sure their arms are aching and their back hurts and they're exhausted at this point. And they've already, you know, they, they fed all these people. We had a healing service. We fed you guys. You know, now I've been working hard in here. And then they look up and they see something coming at them. I would be terrified too. Would you not be, right? You're kind of like, what is happening? I don't know if you guys have, were in the hailstorm the other day, <laughs> but it was hard to see right? When you're in the midst of it, it's hard to see. And so you have no idea. You just see something coming at you. So I can think of three, three reasons why they would be terrified. One is they're in the middle of a storm and they can't really see, right? Um, the second one is John the Baptist just died. And they're like, it's a ghost. It's John the Baptist. He's coming. You know, like, ah, they're panicking. And the third, most obvious, I think, no one's ever walked on water before. <laughs> They have no reason to think, like, how is Jesus? I mean, they have no, sometimes we forget it because we read these things so much. They're like, this has never happened. No one is expecting that, right? I mean, I'm, I'm just inferring, I'm just taking contextual cues from here that they did not expect to see Jesus walking on the water. They did not expect that. But aren't you glad that you serve a God who meets you in unexpected ways, at unexpected times, in unexpected places. Aren't you glad? He doesn't need my permission to show up on my behalf. He doesn't need my permission to come into my life. You know, he can come in in these most impossible ways that we can't even, we can't even imagine. And he can come in and he works for our good. It's amazing. So, he shows up on the water, which I think is amazing. But what is even more amazing is that Peter's first thought is, Jesus, if it's you, tell me to come. I have to be honest, that's not even the 20th thing I would have thought. I mean, seriously, I, I was like, there's so many things. Jesus was in a boat with them during a storm, and he, with a word, calmed the sea. I would have been like, Jesus, pull that one out of your pocket. Like, you know, I mean, there's so many things I could think of, like, hey, have me come out and walk on the water with you, is not one of them. So I know a lot of times the 11 get kind of a hard time with the fact that they didn't say anything. I would not have thought to say that. I'm just being honest. There's no chance, right? And, you know, I don't know. If I've, so Jesus says, come. It says that Peter stepped out of the boat and walked toward Jesus. I'm just saying that the conditions are not ideal for water walking, okay? Like, if this is my first water walking session, this is not the circumstances I would want to do it in, right? So there's this wind and waves, and just imagine this. So imagine, Peter is exhausted. This is my assumption, though. Like, he's exhausted. He's been straining for 10 hours at oars. If he steps out of the boat and the water does not hold him, the chances are he's not going to make it. 
It's much harder to get back in a boat than it is to get out of a boat. If that water doesn't hold him, chances are he's not going to make it. Right? But he says, if it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus says, come. And he walks on the water. And, but then when he saw the wind and the waves, he was afraid. And he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, a lot of immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. You have little faith. He said, why do you doubt? I can think of three things from my study of this that, um, you know, I'm kind of like, why would Jesus call Peter out in the water? Why would Peter want to walk in the, like, in the midst of the storm? Don't forget, the storm is still raging. It hasn't calmed yet. Why would Peter want to step out and go to Jesus? Why would Jesus even calm to? I can think of three things. One is, is that the sea is where you are forced to trust in Jesus. You're forced to trust in Jesus, right? You can't do it. You know, he wants to call you out of your boat of security and into the sea of uncertainty. And the thing is, like, when Jesus asks you, like, when Jesus asks you to, to, hey, you feed them, you feed them. You're like, Jesus, I can't feed them. Like, yeah, come on the water. I can't come on the water. And you're like, right, you need me. You need me. Jesus puts us in places where we are in desperate need of him. Because if not, like, you know, if we were qualified, Jesus doesn't call us to do something or go somewhere or do something for his kingdom that we're qualified to do. Let's just be clear. If we were qualified to do it, and we, did, we wouldn't need him. It wouldn't take any faith. We could do that on our own. What's the point of that? But if you're wondering, like, why Jesus has me doing things, and then there's storms, and there's all this stuff, why is that? It's because God is trying to grow you. God is trying to grow you. If your knowledge of God is this much, and your comfort zone is all out here, and God asks you to do something outside of your comfort zone, and you do it, and you see him come through, all of a sudden your knowledge of God gets bigger, right? And then he pushes you outside, and then it gets bigger. And your view of God and your understanding of who God is gets bigger. And there's no end to that, by the way. There's no end to that. God cares more about your character than he does about your comfort. So he's going to put you in places where you need him. So Jesus calls Peter out of the boat because it forces us to place trust in Jesus. Second one is that that is where Jesus is right then. Jesus is on the water right then. A lot of times we go, well, Jesus used to, when I was doing this before, Jesus was there and he was in that. And you're like, that's great. You know where Jesus is right now? He's out there. He's out there. And I think Peter, I think Peter is basically saying, I'd rather be in a storm with Jesus than in the safety of a boat without Jesus. I'd rather be in the storm with Jesus than in the safety of a boat without Jesus. Right? Because the water, right, water, I'm, I'm not like a scientist, but I do know that we can't stand on water, right? That's not, it's not made like that, right? And it's, it's designed, I mean, it's kind of like if you can't swim and you get in the water, you're going to drown. I mean, it's designed basically to kill you, right? And then this boat that's designed to kind of transport you and safely keep you in the midst of water, Right? It's going to save you. It's going to hold you up in the water, right? But I think what Peter is saying is that when you're with Jesus, the thing that's supposed to kill you will hold you up, right? Jesus is on the water. That water that's supposed to take me down holds me up. But also, on the other hand, you know, the thing that's supposed to hold me up, that boat, might kill me because we're not stepping out. I'm not literally kill you, but, you know, it might... It's going to stifle you to be in that safe place. You can choose that. I don't think that's God's best for you. And the last thing is this, that it glorifies God. It says this. 
when Peter got down in the boat, he walked on the water, he came toward Jesus, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And the picture I have of this, I love this because I just imagine Jesus' hand like wrapped around his forearm, holding him and pulling him up and like kind of gently saying like, oh man, you know, like, why, why are you a little faith? Why did you doubt? You know, but he doesn't say that in front of everyone, which I love. He just said, that's just between these two. He's like, why did you doubt? I'm right here. Do you think Peter had more um, courage the next time Jesus asked him to do something? I do. I also think that he's failed plenty of times after that when Jesus asked him to do something. But that doesn't keep you from doing it. Jesus is still calling you, right? So it says, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and said, you have little faith, why do you doubt? And then they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Okay, so the wind still raging, first time the wind dies down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. And my point is that the 11 maybe didn't walk on water, but they saw it. They were watching, and it impacted them. And I'm not saying we do things for God so that other people can see it. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that while you're doing that, other people are going to see. And it's going to impact them too. It glorifies God because they're stepping out. Right? So... We walk on, the, Jesus calls us out of our boat of security into the water of uncertainty because it makes us, forces us to put our trust in Jesus, right? It's where Jesus is right now, and it glorifies him. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for the truth of your word that um, all of us, if we're not currently in a storm in our life, we will be or have been. And so, Lord, I just pray that um, these words would comfort us in that time, that we would hold on to the truth that you are right there, that you are right there. Lord, give us faith. In Jesus' name.